this school um, around the area. And um, we also have a national outreach program where we coordinate similar initiatives across the US um, to develop resources and um, share knowledge. Um, so maybe I'm gonna talk a little bit more about our training. Um, basically our goal is to help farmers um, and we do this through every step of the farming journey from the very beginning when people are really thinking about getting into farming up to working with farmers that are already farming and helping them develop and grow their business. Um, so we have a bunch of courses. If this is something that you're interested in, you should visit our website. Um, we have a crop production course that is coming up soon. Um, and we also have a practicum course that will be in person focusing on uh, sustainable vegetable production. Um, and maybe the core aspect of our training is our incubator farm. Um, so for people who are in the Massachusetts area, we have a farm. We are based in Beverly and we have basically 16 acres of land that we use as an incubator. So what this means is that we rent um, the land to people who want to start a business and for up to three years, they can use this land, grow their business. We provide them with equipment, um, technical um, assistance, infrastructure, basically all what they need to start a farm. Um, we help them grow this business. And then after three years, we'll help them transition into their own land. Um, so if this is something that you, know, you have been thinking about farming, you're interested in all of this, please um, visit our website. And now I'm gonna um, transfer it over to Flo, um, who has been basically um, the workforce behind um, all what you're gonna see today. She's been working with us developing this course um, on hydroponics. Okay, so before I share my screen and share the presentation that I made for everybody, as Julian said, my name is Flo. I'm the hydroponic development intern at New Entry. And the past few months I've been working on developing the online hydroponics course as, as well as um, um, some reports that we've been working on with our partners and building the entire hydroponics program. So I'll go ahead and share my screen. I will turn off my camera just because my Wi-Fi is a little funny and I don't want any lags to happen. All right, so this is our hydroponics workshop. Um, oops. Okay, so first of all, I want to thank everybody for coming to our workshop and showing interest in New Entry's new hydroponic program. Um, the team is Julie and Ben and I have been working very hard on this project for the last few months, and we can't wait to release all the materials that we have been working on. I will do my best to keep this presentation and entertaining and engaging for everybody so it doesn't feel like a long talk. Um, but please feel free to ask any questions at the end pertaining to the material, the course, or anything that you might be curious about. We do have a guest speaker at the end who will I who I will introduce later on. Um, but let's just get started with the presentation. Um, I did want to hear from two or three people that are in our Zoom audience about what your experience with hydroponics is, if you have any, or what brought you to the workshop and um, piqued your curiosity, if anybody wants to raise their hand or just on mute. So my, the, my school that I work at just recently purchased a um, Babylon micro farm, which is a hydroponic like micro farm. Um, so I'm interested in gardening and this course piqued my interest because we've been working with our, um, our micro garden. Um, so I wanna try and learn as much as I can so I can be an expert at, at running the, the garden we have. That's right. Thanks. Thank you for sharing. Is there anybody else that has any experience or reason for joining the workshop? 
Yeah. Hi. Um, I I've been really interested into experimental um gardening. I like to say. So um, let's say like maybe I'll try different different ways to plant or different types of seeds. Um, and so, you know, hydroponics was just really interesting to me. So I've been watching a lot of videos and I've been buying everything I'm preparing, but I just, um, when I saw this opportunity, I, I knew it was for me. That's awesome. Well, I'm glad we can be there for you in some way. <laughs> Is there anybody else? Uh, hi, my name is Burrell Jones. I'm uh, from Northern Arizona region. Um, I We have a garden setup that we developed a few years ago, and we're kind of introducing hydroponics to growing methods. Uh, because we're in an arid region, um, we're based on the, the Navajo Reservation, and I'm one of the tribal members. And we're trying to build a, a way to um, explore different techniques of water conservation while growing food out on the reservation area. So I think it would be an interesting to kind of, an interesting research project to see if there could be local produce grown um, by just limiting our amount of water that we use versus drip irrigation and flood irrigation methods. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing. That's fantastic. All right, um, unless there's anybody else that would like to share, I'm gonna move on um, to the rest of the presentation. Um, all right, so before I start, I wanted um, to introduce myself a little bit and basically tell you um, why I'm talking about hydroponics and why I got involved in the project in the first place. Um, so, I'm originally from Costa Rica, and I moved to the United States about five years ago in 2019. Um, I started my undergraduate career at uh, Salve Regina University in Newport, Rhode Island as an environmental studies and sociology double major with a minor in food studies. Um, my freshman year at Salve, I got involved with the hydroponic student organization and the organization had been around for about 10 years by the time that I joined in, and it's a student-led organization. It's one of the reasons I enrolled at Salve in the first place. Um, I was with the organization for about four years, and my second year there, I became one of the leaders. And most of the produce that we grew, we would donate to food pantries, um, we would sell at farmers markets, um, and then we went on to partner with different restaurants in Newport, Rhode Island, um, and we would supply the produce that we that they were interested in. Um, my last two years at Salve, I focused on uh, sustainable food systems as my career path and conducted research um, with community organizations uh, relating to hydroponics. I then started at Tufts last fall at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy, pursuing a degree in agriculture, food and environment. Um, and once I started at Tufts, I came, up, came across the hydroponic development opportunity with New Entry and began working with them in October. I am by no means an expert in hydroponics, but I do have some experience that I thought was worth sharing with everybody. Um, and now that we're in the final months of um, our hydroponic program and getting ready to release the course, I thought it was a good time to start sharing what we've all been up to recently. Okay, so a little bit about our program. Um, with the support of Tufts University, the hydroponics program was actually started a few years ago. Uh, new entry was donated some hydroponic systems, but unfortunately, due to a lack of space, we donated to our two partner organizations. One of them is Building Audacity and Essex North Shore. Building Audacity is a nonprofit organization focused on STEM and agricultural technology that empowers youth. Um, and some of the programs that they have going on include a uh, youth-led solution to food sovereignty and their food justice and ag tech program. Um, so these programs aim to provide healthy food sources um, that are culturally appropriate um, and that are then delivered to the most vulnerable families in the greater Boston area. 
Uh, Julian and I had the privilege to go visit Essex North Shore. So for those of you that don't know, Essex Tech is a technical and agricultural high school in Massachusetts. And within their plant sciences program, they have a field dedicated to hydroponics. So they have um, pretty cool facilities and a bunch of different systems that I will show later in the presentation. Um, most of their produce right now goes to their culinary program, but during the summers, they said that they donate to food pantries and also sell at their farmer's market. Um, the purpose of the project, it was started as a way to encourage community engagement between organizations and the communities where each organization is homed. Um, most of the programs working with hydroponic systems aim to mitigate food insecurity for um, vulnerable families in the greater Boston area and aim to create a more resilient food system. Um, the last product of our program is our online hydroponics course, um, which I've mentioned. Um, I will go more in depth about the course later in the presentation, but just quickly, the course is aimed to be accessible for diverse audiences. It's an introductory online asynchronous course composed of six modules. Um, and hopefully the success of the course will lead to bigger and better things for our hydro program. Okay, so what is hydroponics? For those of you that are new to hydroponics, the USDA defines hydroponics as a technique of growing plants using water-based nutrient solutions rather than soil and can include aggregate substr substrates and, gr and growing media. So the water-based nutrient solution is artificially added to the water and can be measured to create the perfect environment for the plants that are growing. Each plant has different uh, needs in terms of nutrients, uh, pHs, um, and so giving a controlled environment where those plants live, usually they can thrive more easily and in some ways grow a little bit faster. Um, these are some photos of the hydroponic systems that we saw at Essex Tech. Um, now, um, the course goes more in depth on the advantages and disadvantages of hydroponics, but here are some of the ones that are a little bit more uh, known. Um, so hydroponics is often, uh, perceived as being very space efficient because it allows for the compact growth of plants. Um, that way you can maximize your yield and minimize the need for extensive root systems. In hydroponics farming, there is what we know as vertical farming, which means that you can go up instead of going horizontally, which is how you can maximize your space and grow as many plants as possible. Um, hydroponics can provide the opportunity for year ground year round growing. And as the controlled environments allow for cultivation at any time of the year, like we here in Boston have uh, colder seasons that don't allow for the growth of several different types of plants, hydroponics allows you to grow year round regardless of the weather. Um, Lastly, for faster plant growth, plants in hydroponic systems often grow faster than their soil grown counterparts due to the availability of an optimal nutrient mix and the optimal conditions that I mentioned previously. Now with the disadvantages, hydroponics um, can have a pretty significant initial cost that a lot of people um, might not be aware of. So depending on how big your operation will be, setting up a hydroponic system often involves significant expenses. Some of the key components include the systems themselves, the grow lights, the nutrient solutions, um, the testing equipment and growing mediums. Um, some of these costs can be brought down with sort of DIY systems or using natural light as opposed to um, the artificial grow lights. And in smaller scale operations, um, these are often used uh, for like hobbies or smaller farms that are just starting off with hydroponics. Um, hydroponics also has a pretty substantial dependence on electricity. Um, so they rely on a heavily, uh, heavily on a steady electrical supply to operate the lights, the pumps and so on. some systems themselves are electrical too. 
Um, this unfortunately makes them vulnerable to power outages and even a brief interruption in power can stress plants and extend and extended outages might lead to considerable crop loss. If you have um, more DIY systems, sometimes they don't require electricity, um, but for, uh, usually for commercial hydroponic systems, uh, electric dependence on electricity is crucial. Um, lastly, uh, for water usage, although hydroponics often uses less water than traditional agricultural operations, it still requires a consistent and ample water supply, which, which can be a limitation in water scarce areas or during droughts, which some states are more prone to. Um, yeah. Okay, so moving on to the test variables. So these are some of the variables that you would be testing in a hydroponic system. The PPM, as many of you I'm sure know, is the parts per million, and this is the concentration of minerals in the water that plants will ultimately absorb. Uh, fruiting crops will often require higher PPMs compared to herbs and grains. Um, usually with a quick Google search, you can always find what the desirable PPM is for your plants, whether you want to grow lettuces or cucumbers. Um, usually everything is available online. Um, the pH is the acidity of the water. So the pH can affect the availability of nutrients for plants. So some nutrients are more available at a neutral, neutral pH. Others are, mo are more bio bioavailable at higher or lower pHs. Um, the pH will depend um, on the crop that's produced, but most of them prefer a pH between 5.5 and 6.5. Um, most hydroponic operations use artificial lights for their plants, um, and these can be put on timers to mimic day and night. Um, there are different types of grow lights that you can use. Some are more efficient and potent than others. Uh, for example, you can have fluorescent lights, LED lights, HIDs, um, among others, and usually depending on the type of crop that you are growing. Um, you can change which type of light you use to um, essentially make the um, crops more effective. Um, a lot of hydroponic operations are temperature controlled, um, which allow you to grow produce year round. Um, when I did my hydroponic research, luckily we had um, the basement available to one of the dorms. So that's where they made the hydroponic system or operation. Um, and so we had heat and air conditioner to stabilize the temperature. Um, a lot of uh, people will introduce their hydroponic systems into greenhouses or some systems can even be put outside during the growing season so that you can optimize what you're growing. Um, now, there are different uses to hydroponics. Not everything is um, for commercial use or for farming. Um, but uh, hydroponics, ha the commercial use of hydroponics has been a, a thriving market recently or in the past few years. Uh, one local commercial producer of hydroponics is Little, Little Leaf Farms here in Massachusetts. Uh, they have a 10 acre greenhouse and in 2023, they reached $100 million in sales. Um, as I mentioned, hydroponics has been a booming market and in 2023, there were 2,500 hydroponic farms, um, small, small scale farms um, that have introduced hydroponics to their businesses as a way to increase their production potential and um, therefore their revenue. A lot of universities have also started to incorporate hydroponics as research topics and, and as professional fields. Some of the universities with the largest hydroponic programs include Ohio State University um, that has a hydroponic crop program. Uh, Cornell University has a program on controlled environment agriculture. And the University of Arizona has a controlled environment agriculture center. Um, I think a lot of people have started uh, hydroponics as a hobby. I know that I especially did that during the pandemic um, I was stuck in a New York City apartment and I filled the apartment with all types of hydroponic plants. 
Um, but people have started to incorporate it into their homes as a tech-based form of gardening that can be tailored to different needs and different space um, that individuals have available as people start mi migrating to urban cities. Not a lot of people have the luxury of owning or having a backyard or a large space to garden. Um, but yeah. Okay. So as I mentioned, Julian and I had the opportunity to visit one of I one of our hydroponic partner organizations, Essex Tech. Um, and one of the teachers from the school was kind enough to give us a tour of their facilities and showed us uh, some of the numerous hydroponic systems that they had going on, um, along with all the different plants that the students were growing and um, the different types of research that they were conducting. Um, the first photo on the left over here are peppers that they were growing. And I actually tried to grow peppers at one point, but they did not look like this. Um, the picture here in the middle, you can see our heirloom tomatoes and the system on the right is an example of the vertical hydroponic farming that I was talking about that maximizes space. And usually um, systems like this will be used to grow different types of lettuces or leafy greens and herbs. Um, this is, these are some other pictures that they have at Essex Tech. So the picture on the left um, is an, ex it, well, they, they have aquaponics over there at um, Essex Tech. So aquaponics usually introduces fish to the reservoirs where the nutrient rich uh, solutions would go. And the fish provide um, natural fertilizers for the plants. Um, and these, they said they were using to uh, as animal feed, not for human consumption, but they had, this is just a small representation of what they had, but they had pretty cool tanks over there. Um, and then the system on the right is an example in a, of an NFT system. Um, and this, used them, this system they were getting ready to use um, and they were hoping to produce an additional 550 heads of lettuce per week that would go to their culinary program and to other community engagement activities. All right, so now moving on. Oh wait, no. Are there any questions before I move on? I don't wanna talk for a long time if you guys have questions. If not, I can move on. All right, um, so let's talk about some of the different types of hydroponic systems. Um, I will not go over all the types of hydroponic systems because there's definitely quite a few, but I'll introduce some of the biggest ones that you might encounter. Um, so the first one is an NFT technique or an NFT system. In this system, the plants are placed in sloping channels that you can see on the diagram at the top. Um, the water is pumped with the nutrified water and continuously passes over the root systems. Um, in this system, there's no need for inorganic mediums since the roots will flow directly into the water. Um, and usually the NFT systems are closed systems that recirculate the same water by pumping it to the higher end of the channels that then flow back down um, into the reservoir at the bottom. Um, and as I said, you can see the diagram um, where the trays are um, at an angle and the water will flow down. Um, the angle will prevent the water from accumulating and potentially overflowing and causing leaks. These are some examples of different NFT systems um, and what they might look like depending on the purpose of your hydroponic system. The two systems at the top represent smaller scale hydroponics that you can introduce into your home. Or for example, the image on the top left can be an example of a smaller scale hydroponic business. Um, the image at the bottom is representative of a commercial hydroponic NFT system similar to the one that I showed from Essex Tech. This one is obviously at a much, much larger, larger scale. Okay. Um, then we have WIC systems. Uh, WIC systems is one of the simpler hydroponic systems and they're great for beginners. Uh, the reservoir 
at the bottom holds all the nutrient enriched water and a wick will extend from the growing medium down to the reservoir. The wick will help keep the roots moist and nourished. Um, and here the diagram at the top, you can show, you can see how the wicks are extending from the plant roots down to the reservoir. Um, these are some examples of what wick systems might look like. As I said, wick systems are usually used in smaller operations or for beginner hydroponic systems. So I could not find any photos of commercially used WIC systems, but um, this is what they might look like. A lot of people will use um, buckets or tote storage containers and convert them into small hydroponic systems. So in this one, you can see how the wicks are extending from the roots down to the reservoir. And the picture on the right is just an example of what the wick might look like um, in the basket with the plants. All right. So then we have an ebb and flow system. In an ebb and flow system, the plants are embedded in a growing medium and are placed over the nutrient rich water reservoir. Um, the pump in these systems will periodically fill the growing medium. And when the pump turns off, the water will drain back into the reservoir. Most ebb and flow systems are hydroponic deep tables. Um, that are filled with growing media, such as uh, expanded clay pellets that provide structure to the um, to the plants. And these are also closed systems because the water is circulated and recycled. Um, these are some examples of what that can look like. At the top over here, you can see um, a commercial ebb and flow system, um, and the boat and the photos at the bottom are smaller scale operations. Um, the system most similar to the diagram is on the previous slide is a picture in the middle over here where the deep table is filled with the clay pellets and the pump will periodically fill the table with water. This um, white thing that you see over here will be the pump that drains it back down to the reservoir one, once it's filled up. Um, and the photos on the right and left contain individual buckets that have holes at the bottom um, that, sus that sustain the plants and the pumps will fill the space until they reach the roots and then drain back down. So it's the same concept, just a different type of setup. Okay. So now moving on to deep water culture systems. In a deep water culture systems, the plants are placed, oops, in a deep water culture system, yes, the plants are uh, placed in pots that are held by a flow and that will allow the plant roots to grow directly into the nutrient rich water. An air pump is usually placed in the water you, to oxygenate the water and keep the roots um, healthy and prevent algae growth because the algae will ultimately suck all the oxygen out of the water and can um, suffocate the roots. Um, so this is what uh, these look like. The larger picture shows a commercial deep water culture system. Most of these will usually will usually grow uh, various types of lettuces. Um, and if you pick up one of the floats, like the picture on the right, um, you can see all the roots growing directly into the water. Um, some smaller scale deep water culture systems can be made from storage stoats, um, like the other system that I mentioned previously, where you can drill holes onto the lid um, to fit the plants, and then the bin is filled with water to feed the plants. Um, so this is what uh, something that could be low cost um, for hydroponic systems. Um, lastly, we have a drip system. In a drip system, the pump will transport the water into drip lines from the water reservoir into the growing medium. And a drip system is a drip system line is assigned to each plant. Um, and the drip systems allow for the fine tuning of nutrient concentrations and water intensity. Uh, these are closed systems because, again, the water will drain back into the reservoir um, and will recirculate the system several times. Uh, these are some variations of drip line systems. The picture on the left over here 
is a commercial drip system where you can see the drip lines at the bottom of each um, tomato plant. Um, and over on the top right corner uh, are the popular tower systems that are a variation of drip lines um, as they don't have drip lines, but the water that trickles down touches each individual plant root. Um, lastly, here at the bottom, you can see an example of a smaller scale drip line system where the water is pumped from underneath and directly to each plant at the bottom, at the top of the system through the steady lines that you can see um, at the top. Moving on to some of the, or to a lesser nice topic um, and talk about some of the common plant pests and diseases that you can encounter in hydroponic operations. I'm sure most of you are familiar with these, um, but I thought it was important to cover them as you can also encounter them in hydroponic systems. Um, so starting with spider mites, these are most common in indoor gardening and due to their small size, they might go unnoticed for a while until they start causing significant damage to your plants. Uh, usually a way to spot them is to look for spider-like webs, or you can take a tissue and wipe the underside of the leaves. And usually if there's blood on the, on the tissue, then it's a sign of um, spider mite presence. Then you have thrips that are also tiny little animals that cause visible damage. Um, you can usually identify them by spotting black dots on the top of leaves and they will most likely cause the leaves to turn brown and dry because they will suck them dry, essentially. Um, then you have aphids that will come in different colors. They can be green, black, or gray, and usually weaken your plants as they suck the juice out of the leaves and turn them yellow. Usually they're concentrated on the stem of the plants, and we had the most trouble with these when we were growing kale. Um, then you have white flies. They almost look like tiny white moths. And fortunately, they're easy to spot, but hard to kill because they can fly and infect nearby systems. And in closed hydroponic operations, it can be very difficult to contain a pest or a disease. Um, these will, yes. Um, then you have fungus gnats, um, and these will leave eggs in the growing media. Uh, which can feed on the roots and slow the plant growth and cause bacterial infections. Um, so what are some of the solutions to these pests? So some ways to mitigate all of these include implementing sticky traps around the room and close to the plant roots to catch and identify the pests. Blue traps can usually attach thrips and yellow traps can attract fungus, gnats, and white flies. Um, you can use a variety of pesticides, but you may want to avoid chemical poisons. Um, you can spray organic pesticides and a homemade remedy that we often use at the lab um, was warm water mixed with Dawn soap for initial outbreaks. But essentially, the best way to mitigate, mitigate these is to take out the plants entirely. Um, some people will introduce predatory species, um, such as nematodes, that will hunt down the pests and mitigate the outbreaks. Now, moving on to some of the common plant diseases that you might encounter. Um, so some of these include powdery mildew that looks kind of like sprinkled white powder on your leaves and stems. If they're not treated, it could cause um, stunting, leaf, lo leaf loss, yellowing, or death. Um, then we have downy mildew. It is usually concentrated on the underside of leaves and causes the yellowing of leaves. Um, then you have gray mold, also known as ash mold or ghost spots. Uh, it usually starts out as spots on the leaves and becomes gray fuzzies that will turn your plants brown and mushy. Um, so what are some of your disease remedies? So in this case, prevention is your best friend. Um, with Around hydroponic operations, usually people will ask you to wear clean clothes and shoes to prevent the contamination of hydroponic systems. Uh, the pests and diseases can attach to your clothing and spread to your plants, and it's always a good idea to wear a pair of shoes when entering a hydroponic space. 
I know when I worked in a hydroponic lab, it was um, common for everybody to take off their shoes before entering the lab. And usually when somebody ignored this rule, um, a pest will outbreak would occur. Um, in hydroponic operations, you will, because there's a lot of water involved, um, there will be a lot of spills and runoff. So mold and mildew can thrive in excess water and humid environments. Um, so it's always important to make sure that the spaces around your plants are always clean and dry. And a lot of people will introduce humidifiers to keep the temperature and humidity at a stable um, point. Um, and then, as always, it's important to clean your plants. So take out the dead leaves, uh, the dry leaves, to seize branches, among other things. Um, before I start talking about our online course, are there any questions or comments? I have a question. Hi, my name is Karen. Sure. Uh, so, uh, are you Flor Florencia? Yes, I'm Florencia. Okay, okay. Uh, so, Florencia, um, my question is about like uh, uh, support by the government. They have like um, business support is because let me just figure out is um, if like the Department of Agriculture they have some support for for hydroponics or. Uh, if I would like to start a business in this area, I have to have my own money. Um, that's a good question and a question that I'm not too familiar with. I know that there are a lot of organizations that will help fund starting hydroponic businesses. I don't know if it comes directly from the EPA, but they um, have started to do a lot of work with hydroponic farmers. So I'm sure there's a way that the EPA can, um, or the USDA can fund um, some of these small operations, but I cannot say confidently whether that's the case or not. Oh, okay. My, my other question, it's about, uh, because the winter here is like 10 months. Um, yeah. Does it have men, uh, uh, like um, many, uh, uh, People work with here hydroponics, like maybe inside in a warehouse or close, not close a uh, place. Or uh, do you know about that here in, in Massachusetts? Whether people do it indoors? Yes, indoors. Yes. Um, yes. So a lot of most of the hydroponic operations in. Um, areas that have significant seasonal changes will do hydroponics indoors just so that they can um, grow produce year round. Um, mm -hmm. But you could always have systems outside during the summer to add to your already uh, summer produce, if that makes sense. So essentially you could have both, but to grow year round indoors would be the best um um the best, it's the best place way. For to have a, <laughs> maybe i don't know the cost is maybe uh indoors maybe cost more than uh like uh uh outside uh maybe like south carolina <laughs> maybe is the best place for this kind <laughs> of <laughs> no yes no yeah i agree indoors will definitely drive up your cost a little bit or a lot oh. yeah um, unless you already have available space that you can put them in a lot of people or a lot of operations have started to turn empty warehouses or empty spaces for hydroponic production um but it depends on what you have access to or already available okay okay maybe i can jump in on your first question um it is usually rare for federal uh, grants to award money for equipment and infrastructure. Um, there are a few, but maybe another place where you could look is um, MDAR, so the Massachusetts Department of Agriculture. They sometimes have some grants um, for for similar for projects like this, um, and. There are a bunch of like small grants here and there um, that 
could um, fit in here. Um, so yeah, like we, for example, if you were to sign up to our mailing list, we try to send, we have like a resource mailing list that basically sends like a list of all the grants that um, you could apply to. So if you're trying to look for funds, that's a place where you could um, look for. Or could you send me like, because you can send a message to other here, you can could send me like the link or the yeah, email? I will. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, well, thank you so much for your questions. So we're, those were very good questions that I'm sure other people um, were wondering about. All right, um, so moving on to our hydroponics course. So our course is divided into six modules. Um, we started with the introduction that discusses what hydroponics is and some of the history on the expansion and origins of hydroponics, which I will say was very, very interesting to learn about because in four years of um, working with hydroponics, I had no idea where it came from. So the course will go more in depth um, about that. Um, then our second module is systems and materials. Um, so we break down the different support materials and chemical solutions used in hydroponic operations, as well as the types of systems that I touched on a few, but we the course expands on the rest of them. Um, then we move on to maintaining a hydroponic system. So the most important part of hydroponics is knowing how to maintain your system. We created videos on starting hydroponic production, uh, system maintenance with step-by-step -step demonstrations on how to test your water and apply nutrients. A common flaw hydro in hydroponics that you will encounter at some point, which I mentioned briefly, are leaks. Um, so we walk through fixing a leak and how to prevent them with hydroponic systems um, and finishing off with uh, common pests and diseases that we just discussed and then some. Um, then we have a module on hydroponic versus soil that discusses the difference between hydroponic and soil properties. Uh, we discuss USD organic and how it relates to hydroponics and ending with a hopefully fun topic for everybody and not just me, but are there taste differences between hydroponics uh, produce and soil grown produce. Um, then we have a module on data collection and record keeping that are crucial for any agricultural operations. We provided some of the benefits of data collection along with some examples of variables that you can record data on. Uh, we provided Excel templates that you can modify and apply to your own production and hopefully help you record all of the data that you need to. Then our last module is on the financial aspect of hydroponics. So we provide a cost breakdown of hydroponic systems uh, from small, medium to large operations as these can uh, vary significantly in cost. Uh, we provide a cost range of supplies, operational costs, and the profitability of hydroponic production based on averages. So these are some photos of what our hydroponic course looks like. So we decided to provide varying types of learning media, such as um, text, videos, and presentations to make the course more engaging and not make you have to read through pages and pages of text. Um, so these are some examples of what those look like. So the history of hydroponics, the videos on starting hydroponic production, and videos on how to maintain a hydroponic system. All right, so a little bit about our course style. So the course is an asynchronous online course and it's also self-paced. We determined that the entire course could take about 10 hours and some, mod some modules will require more time. Each module is or has supplemental sources on the topics that were discussed in case you wanted to learn more or dig a little deeper on the topics in case we didn't provide enough detail. Um, it is also a non-monitored course. So there are self-assessment quizzes, discussion boards, and comment sections for feedback or to read some of the thoughts that other course takers had to share. But they're meant to um, promote conversation and just if you have 
additional experience or additional thoughts, uh, we invite you to put those in the comment section so that other people can learn about your experience or what you have to say. Um, and because this course is new and hasn't been released yet, we the first round on the course will be free of cost. So we encourage you to take the course, provide feedback, and grow your curiosity and knowledge on hydroponic farming. All right, any questions before we move on to our speaker? All right, I will take that as a no. Um, all right, so I will introduce our speaker very briefly, and then he will take on and show us his what he has to present on today. So our speaker is Christian Hayden. He is the founder and director of Levo International Incorporated. Um, his organization is a nonprofit organization with diverse um, projects that focus on community-led development with um, that are focused on that are household focused, sustainable, and encourage partnerships. So I will stop sharing my screen and then pass it on to him. Great. Is there a way for me to share my screen? Yes, let me just make you a host. You should be able Did to. Did that work for you? Yes. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Let's see if this works. Hold on. Sorry. It's not, hold on one second. Sorry, it's not letting me, I gotta adjust my settings. Sorry. In the meantime. Sorry, go for it. I was just gonna say like in the meantime, if there are questions, people should jump in. Okay. And I'll say related to the course that Flo just talked about, we're still putting the finishing touches on it, but you will probably by the end of the month be receiving an invitation from Canvas. That's the uh, kind of online platform that the course is hosted by. And uh, we'll send you an email as well once we invite you to that course. So you'll know to look for an email from Canvas there. Okay. I'll just open now, start the presentation. All right, back to the beginning. Good adaptation on the fly, Christian. Is that something you have to do? With I should have had this all lined up. I didn't realize that my screen sharing wasn't going to work for me. I'm working on a different computer this evening. Thank you, though. Thank you, everybody. Uh, so, yeah. So, my name is Christian Hyden. I'm the founder of Levo International. So, Levo is a um, we're a social enterprise um, nonprofit organization, um, and really, our goal is around empowering people um, around poverty reduction and our critical leverage point is food and food production um primarily uh hydroponic farming so levo started um as the extension of my eagle scout project in high school uh so uh, we i was looking for a project that would be international and and have an impact and so i basically stumbled upon um, hydroponics and in particular a type of hydroponics called simplified hydroponics back in 2016 um, and we I went down with my father and my brother and and built a hydroponic greenhouse in Haiti which is pictured on the screen here um, we started with a PVC type type, type style of, of hydroponic farming and it's the original greenhouse you can see in the center there 
um, is in, in its construction and on the right is one of our first harvests back in 2016. From that first trip, we really started to look at what the potential of hydroponics was. Um, we were really excited about our initial success and wanted to think about how do we make hydroponics accessible for the average person in Haiti who made less than $2 a day and began developing approaches from that point into making hydroponics accessible for individual households. And so that what that tended to be was small scale hydroponic systems. Uh, we started with, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about it. It's called DFT hydroponics. It's a hybrid system. Um, it's made out of PVC pipes. We hung them from a steel frame. We called it a Babylon system. Um, and all the water was manually circulated. So none of the systems that we operate to this day in Haiti use electricity. They're all manual operation, whether they're circulating or circulating systems. Uh, and so we began developing different approaches using kind of common household items. So we even went simpler. Our largest program is distributing five gallon, what we call buckets, which is Haitian Creole for bucket. Um, hydroponic systems is called crack key hydroponics. Um, where people grow um, callaloo, which is a local green, as well as peppers and tomatoes in five gallon pails, which they can source locally for a couple of dollars. Um, that program has been a huge success. Uh, one of the best things that hydroponics provides, simplified hydroponics provides, is the opportunity to teach people how to grow their own food really quickly and effectively. So uh, we have a 93% success rate for first time users for our program in Haiti, and that over 300 families that we support in Haiti, despite the high level of conflict and unrest that exists currently. We then started in the pandemic to really ramp up our local production and began to take the lessons that we had learned in Haiti and apply them here domestically, primarily in the state of Connecticut, uh, as well as pursuing other international projects uh, and preparing other international projects. So we took that same household approach and started selling and distributing hydroponic systems to local community members in the Hartford area and around the state of Connecticut. Uh, you can see one of those examples on the left and the bottom here. Um, this woman uh, is in the north end of Hartford, which is one of the worst food deserts in the country. Uh, from that program, we actually started to learn a lot, a whole lot of lessons about operating in the United States and, and potentially building business models around hydroponics. Uh, and so from 2020, uh, oh, sorry, there's more systems from 20, uh, 2017 to 2021, um, different variations of it. Some of them higher end um, variations and some of them lower end variations, um, whether it's about production or, or looking nice in somebody's backyard. Uh, we really wanted to build a business model um, rather than a traditional charitable model uh, where we could create revenue to do the work that we were doing. Um, so we've always been pretty business focused. It's impact first, not profit, um, which, but the creating revenue streams that can sustain the impact and work that we do with communities that are vulnerable and need uh, employment and food security. From that work, we actually started to scale up. So we began to uh, acquire more property and scale up our systems. Uh, which you can see in the pictures here. So we acquired several greenhouses, 104 greenhouses and filled them with hydroponic systems last year. Uh, we started in 2022, converting vacant lots into hydroponic farms, um, training local residents in hydroponic farming and employing them in the hydroponic space. We, we've experimented with a number of different models and, and have kind of landed on an employee um, model uh, where we bring in on either stipend or, or hourly uh, or full-time, part-time, depending on, on what their role is in the organization. Uh, so we started with growing uh, a wide range. We launched the CSA program. Um, so we sell subscriptions to people locally um, through the summer and through the spring. And then in the summer, we grow vegetables and, and distribute weekly. Um, so that program has grown steadily over the last three years. Um, as has our production um, and exponentially. Um, so we uh, started in 2022, we grew about 4,000 pounds of produce. In 2023, uh, we grew about 15,000, uh, 2022, I'm sorry, we grew about 15,000 pounds of produce and our projections for 2024 are about 50,000 pounds of produce, um, all grown hydroponically. And that's in-house, none of our clients. Um, so the, secondly, as we work, what we do is we do a bunch of client-based 
work. So we work with community organizations, community members, teaching people hydroponics. We offer free classes to the community and we do a whole bunch of work with organizations like food pantries and schools, uh, building, uh, building them hydroponics, training their staff or their community in hydroponics, and then helping them throughout the season. Uh, so we have some really cool projects on that side of things, doing things like rooftop farming for Hartford Hospital, which is one of the largest hospitals in the state of Connecticut, uh, providing them with fresh produce for their patients, uh, as well as working with small church groups and, and, and school systems and things like that. Uh, so we do a whole bunch of work. We've expanded internationally. Um, we also now do work in um, Jamaica and Oaxaca, Mexico. We've been doing we've recently expanded projects in, in Puerto Rico. Um, all of those operations are relatively new, but are, are growing. Uh, are all, all, all three of those new regions are growing. Our Haiti operation has kind of stayed stagnant since we hit about a thousand households due to the fact that it's very difficult to scale an operation when it's difficult to send anyone to the country. Um, so our Haitian operation has a paid staff, but they're kind of stuck in limbo and where they're operating um, until we can secure a better source of fertilizer. Uh, so Flo did a whole bunch in talking about different types of systems. And so I'm not gonna repeat the things that she said, but I, I'll talk a little bit about the kind of things that we do and, and touch on the different types of hydroponics and provide some context based off our experience with hydroponics and, and different types and approaches. So the first, which is what most people think about, is the indoor uh, hydroponics, um, doing setting up a controlled environment agriculture completely. So the main benefit of that is, of course, year-round growing and the ability to grow consistently and effectively, maximizing kind of your indoor space. The biggest risk to doing indoor farming and where we always caution people around indoor farming is the cost. So it's automatic, pretty almost automatically upfront going to be more expensive than growing outside or in a greenhouse because of the primarily the upfront capital for equipment. So buying your grow lights, buying your system, but then also there's a real cost that people don't realize with the lighting uh, requirements. Um, electricity is not necessarily cheap. If you have access to cheap electricity, then it can make indoor farming and container farming effective, but you can very easily rack up high upkeep costs to grow crops. And generally in an indoor setting, you're not gonna grow things like tomatoes, um, which may be a higher value crop, but the light requirements are so significant that you're, you're gonna spend tons of money and have to build a whole complicated HVAC system to grow those tomatoes. So you're growing mostly leafy greens, which tend not to be a super high value item, right? Unless you hit a niche green. And so you're gonna to struggle to compete with large commercial growers or even local producers of things like lettuce. Uh, so I always caution people who wanna do indoor farming. It's a great option if you wanna set up something in your kitchen or in your house. Um, but if you're trying to do a business, it's really, it's really, really important to take a hard look at the electrical costs. I remember what this peony is because I have no idea what you're putting in here. Uh, high labor cost, there's high upkeep costs. So you wanna really take a hard look at those numbers. Um, but it's great. We use a lot of it, a lot of indoor farming practices for our partners in our educational programs. We're doing a container farm for a school system in Connecticut this year, funded through the state of Connecticut. Um, so there are applications, um, but I, it, as a business, there are some real risks and upkeep costs, which a lot of these leave and large scale growers are facing. The Alternative, which is what we really push for people who are growing in the New England area, is even though we have cold, relatively cold winters, um, you do still have a decent amount of light and access. And so a greenhouse can create a great opportunity to kind of hit that balance between indoor agriculture and outdoor agriculture. Um, and so you get the benefit of sunlight, so you don't have to have as high lighting costs. You can add supplemental lighting depending on what you're growing. Um, and you can add heat, heating components. And so it creates this great middle ground between fully controlling every aspect and not having any environmental controls. Um, so there is some upfront cost, obviously greenhouses don't come free, um, but it creates a great balance because you can kind of control. So even right now in the springtime, last week it was beautiful in Connecticut. I imagine it was beautiful in Massachusetts, uh, but it's not about it's not about the average temperature, right? It's about that one or two cold nights that kill off your crops. And so if you can control for that one or two cold nights in the springtime, 
you can get a huge jump on, on production if you can add some heating component to your greenhouse, even without supplemental lighting. Uh, we This winter was so mild that in unheated greenhouses, we were able to grow lettuce and bok choy and spinach throughout the entire winter without any supplemental heating in greenhouses. Um, problem with the New England area is you never know what your winter is going to look like. And so having heat controls is valuable. Um, but the greenhouses allow just enough control to uh, really have an impact on New England farming. <clears throat> the, outside of our greenhouses, the big thing that we, that we have pushed, so simplified hydroponics is a different take on hydroponics than commercial hydroponics and makes it more accessible and low cost up front. So as you've seen in a lot of these pictures, we use things that you could go to Home Depot and buy. So you've got PVC pipes, you may have buckets, things that are really simple and easy to afford. Um, they're low cost in comparison. Um, even if you're doing raised beds, it may not actually be that much cheaper to do raised beds versus the hydroponic system. The benefit of a hydroponic system is, is not only the space saving, right? It's using about a quarter of the space. It's using about, you know, depending on the methodology you use, it could save up to 90% of the water. But one of the big benefits is you can grow the same crop in the same place over and over and over and over again, and you never need to worry about the soil quality, right? depleting your soil. So you could set up a system and grow tomatoes in it every single year, and you never have to do crop rotation. So you, once you have a space set up, you can continuously grow on that space. So it, it's a real advantage even outdoors where we grow a lot of our crops um, because we have increased efficiency of space and water and increase reliability in where and how we grow the plant. So like just it's the amount of slots, right? So we have 300 slots to fill. We don't have to worry about, oh, is that soil depleted over there? Do we need to, can we only plant lettuce there or can we plant tomatoes there? We don't have to worry about that. We know we can put tomatoes there. We know we can put peppers there. So it creates a whole lot of opportunity for you to have greater control, even if you are just outside. Um, greater yield per square foot are about, about our square, our calculation for our urban farms is about a pound per square foot. Um, it can be greater than that or le less than that. It just depends on what kind of crop you're growing. Um, but that's kind of our rough calculation on, on that. Of course, it doesn't give you any environmental control. So you're at the mercy of the elements and pests, right? So greenhouses and indoor farming give you a greater level of control over pests. Outdoor farming, you're basically just we, it's almost an upgrade on traditional agriculture, but it's not a full, the full control that you get from indoor and greenhouse farming. Um, so there's definitely increased risk, similar risks to what farmers face. One of the great things is you're not at risk of flood or drought, um, which a lot of farmers face in New England now is you have year, a summer where you may have no water and you may have a summer where you have way too much water, but because we use an enclosed closed system, even outside, you're protected from severe drought and severe rain, um, which can be a huge benefit if you're a farmer where your, your end product does not, you don't know whether or not you're gonna make any money until you sell, you actually harvest your crop. So having that much more control over your crop gives you a little bit more security, uh, which we found to be really effective in, in urban settings. Um, so I'll touch quickly on the types of hydroponics that we use. So Flo talked about NFT. We don't use NFT hydroponics. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. One of which is that we started developing our systems for areas with unreliable electricity. Um, NFT requires constant electric electrical flow. Um, and it doesn't have any resiliency built. Most of the systems do not have much resiliency built in for if you lost power, the water stops flowing and there's no stored water in the system. Um, or very little. And so your plants very quickly dry out. So in an area like Haiti, where we started, that was just not an option for us to use. But it does have real applications, particularly in the growing of, of leafy greens. Um, it, it can be an efficient way, to, efficient way to grow leafy greens. There are some real risks, like clogging, like having limited variety of things you can grow. So you're stuck with leafy greens. You can't put a tomato plant in those narrow channels like you've seen. And they require, as I said, um, lots of circulation. But one of the benefits is, is they're easy to mechanize, right? They're easy to set up on a timer and run consistently and effectively. The type of system that we really use the most of, and particularly as we scaled up into the farming side of the business, is what we something we call DFT, which is deep flow technique. Uh, it's basically a hybrid between a deep water culture and, a, um, and an NFT style. So you're still circulating the water, 
But unlike uh, NFT, you have water left in the system, in the pipes that you're growing your plant in. We use a larger pipe, some, some generally four inches or larger, which gives you a couple inches of water in the system at all times. And what that does is it, in Haiti, people have to actually physically move the water from the reservoir to the top of the system, but they only have to do that a handful of times a day. We actually published research um, about a year ago on comparing yields from constant circulating systems and intermittently circulating systems. And I've started to demonstrate that you don't, that there's not a real benefit in yield between constant and intermittent um, circulation. Uh, that can be less true in high temperature environments. And so the research, we're still researching that, um, but uh, uh, it, we've successfully grown tomatoes in one of the hottest areas of the world using a intermittent circulation system. Uh, and so I highly recommend this system. It's really a flexible system. It's great for growing greens, but it's also great for growing tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, anything you can need. The biggest risk about this system is uh, clogging, right? So if you have a large root mass system of, of plant like cucumbers, uh, one of the things that you actually have to do is trim the roots. Generally, that's not a thing you have to do for most varieties in this even in this system, it's generally limited to things like cucumbers, squash, and tomatoes. Um, but you definitely, that is a risk. And the more you trim roots, the more risk of disease of the roots that you have. Um, so there is, it's not perfect, um, but it's very, very customizable. Um, so we, you know, we build them on pallets. We build system frames out of two by fours. You can elevate the pipes and decrease the pipes. So the woman in this picture here is, has real difficulty bending over. She has knee problems. Um, but she was able to grow, uh, I think it was about 50 tomato plants in her backyard using this methodology because um, we could elevate the system. You can hang it on a fence. You can hang it on a pallet. Uh, and so it creates a real flexibility because all you have to do is create a level, uh, sit, a stand that's level for your pipe. Um, and so just a matter of, it, we've built, I've built systems out of two by fours, pallets, cinder blocks. doesn't really matter uh, what you build it out of. Um, just depends on what's readily accessible in your environment. So it's a great option. You can even stick it on a table. I, I've hung one off a balcony. Um, you can do a million different things uh, with this method. It's it's very very flexible. Uh, the deep water culture. I don't really need to get into it. We don't do much deep water culture. Uh, it's generally good for leafy greens um, and requires an air stone and con relatively constant air stone. Um, what we do use is uh, what we call cracky style or non-circulating hydroponic systems. Uh, so Bernard Cracky was a researcher at the University of Hawaii and he developed this over 20 years ago. Uh, he didn't publicize it very much, uh, but it is really groundbreaking stuff. Um, basically the idea is the common, the common idea in hydroponics is you need to constantly move the water. It's actually not the case. What you need to do is have an access to oxygen. And so Cracky discovered that if you leave a gap between the top of the water, a significant gap between the top of the water and the, and the bottom of the lid of the bucket or whatever you're using, it creates a, a humid layer, which has oxygen in it. And so the plants actually don't need any circulation or electricity. Um, the roots can simply sit in the water and they'll, they'll gradually recede over time and grow your plants. Um, there are simple ways to refill this system. Uh, you can simply just drill a hole in the side of your bucket, which prevents overfilling. Um, and you just add low strength fertilized water to it consistently. I've seen people grow eight feet tall tomatoes with this method in a five gallon pail. Um, the biggest risk of this system is if you are growing uh, a leafy, uh, a fruiting vegetable, like a tomato plant, tomatoes consume a lot of water and fertilizer. And so it requires you to consistently add water and fertilizer, which means that a five gallon pail, you can do it, but you have to make sure you're maintaining a solid level. We've come up with a number of ways to do that. And so it's not, it's not by no means a difficult thing, but it requires way more consistent attention than some other systems. Cause you need to make sure that you're adding water to assist a bucket full of uh, five gallons of water. You put a tomato plant in that tomato plant could consume two gallons of water on a hot summer day. Uh, so you got to pay attention to it. It's not great for scaling. Um, it's not great for if you're going to do uh, thousands and thousands of pounds of produce. We still use ours. We have over 150 uh, 14 gallon totes from Home Depot that we still use to grow a lot of our leafy greens. 
This method is absolutely outstanding for things like lettuce or bok choy. You can take a 14 gallon bucket like you see in the pictures here, put 15 heads of lettuce in it and leave it because a head of lettuce is gonna use less than a gallon of water for its whole life. So in a 15, 14 gallon bucket, 15 heads of lettuce can grow to full growth. You can actually prune the lettuce and consume it for a couple months before the water will actually run out in the bucket. Um, and at that point, your lettuce has probably run its course and you're gonna reset. So as a starting point, this is the this is the method that I recommend. If you wanted to set something up this summer or set something up even in your house for the grow light, cracky style is the best way to do it because basically once you put the right mix of fertilizer in, uh, we use a two-part fertilizer, it's called Jax, um, and fill it with water, you're good to go. Um, particularly if you're growing in a more protected space. The biggest risk if you're doing it in your backyard is if you have a heavy, heavy rain and the plants are still young, um, there's a risk of diluting the fertilizer in the system. Uh, and so then you might need to add a little bit more fertilizer. Uh, so that's the biggest problem with the cracky style and just exposed environments. In Haiti, it's great because they have drought for most of the year. Um, in New England, depending on the summer, it could be great or it could be more difficult. Um, but put it on a back porch or a patio and then and with enough sunlight, it's an awesome way to grow your leafy greens during, during most of the year. Um, so highly recommend that. Uh, so yes, this is just an example. So we had five gallons of five gallon Lowe's buckets that we filled um, all along the length of our hundred foot greenhouse. We grew a couple hundred pounds of basil over the course of the growing season with this method. Uh, we required some refilling, um, but we've grown a whole bunch of varieties of green herbs are great, as well as uh, uh, things like snap bees. And, and we've tried a number of different plants in this method. So you can see Ron, our farming manager there on the right, it's got a 15 beautiful heads of lettuce that we grew in those bins and we just set them up once, let them run. And you still have, we harvest for market. So you still even have half the reservoir left um, that you could refill and, and rejuvenate and start again. Um, so this is just on our CSA. So as I said, we grew about 25 different types of hydroponic vegetables um, and we've been steadily growing the CSA program. The biggest risk to a CSA um, if you're getting into that space, into the farming space, um, it's great because it's money up front. So people pay ahead of time before you even start the season. So it de-risks the process for you. You already know you have buyers. The biggest problem with the CSA is actually scale, right? So if you only sell 50 subscriptions, you have to meet those 50 subscriptions, which means you have to pay somebody or you yourself has to have to produce that, right? So you want, you need a certain amount of scale. Right, so we found that even the last year, the 100 and I think it's 20 people that we had in our CSA subscription, we still had a shortfall at the end of the year with the amount of labor input that we had to, that we had to do. It was okay because a lot of that shortfall was covered by grant funding and, and youth employment and things like that, um, but it wasn't net profitable by year two. So there's a real risk to it because you need to sell enough. And if you're a new farmer, you don't have an established base. And so you need to have a little bit of um, you need to de-risk that and make sure that you have the base that you need to start. Uh, so it may be easier to sell uh, in a straight retail in, environment. But again, if you sell in a retail environment, you have no guarantee of sales once you produce your product. Um, and then the last thing is diversity. So a CSA, people buy it because they want a bunch of different types of vegetables that are local. Um, and so if you don't, if you only grow a couple of varieties, may not be enough for a CSA program. Um, so some real downsides to the CSA model, um, but there's the real benefit of the community is, is supporting you before the season even starts. Um, they're taking on that risk for you. Uh, uh, and then the last thing is the urban farm side of things that I wanted to touch on. So you, we do this on vacant lots. So we're converting as many blighted properties as the city of Hartford will give us into urban farms. Um, what's great is that if there's lead in the soil, we don't care um, because we don't grow in the soil. Um, so we can take a property and very quickly clear it out and fill it with hydroponic systems. Um, so the, what you see there is in one month, we took that vacant lot on the left and turned it into the one on the right, um, filling with hydroponic systems. Uh, we used a lot of volunteer labor, um, but we've, we could very quickly convert that because the systems are very simple to assemble 
and um, don't require any real remediation of the site or working on the site itself. Um, that site is actually completely off grid. It's all solar powered and we use a rain collection system to collect the water for the systems. Um, and so we've done that, a number of those throughout the city of Hartford. So you see on the top right there is another one of the farms that we set up. We use a whole lot of pallets for our systems. We've done some experimentation with growing even on the ground. Don't recommend that. Elevate your systems. Uh, costs a little bit more, but it's way more reliable when it comes to leveling and things like that. Um, but you can see we still, from the beginning, we still were using the bokeh sips, the, the 14 gallon Home Depot bins um, to, to get going. And that's definitely the, the most afford one of the most affordable ways to start is using those pails. Um, and that's it. Um, we are we do a whole lot of support around the construction, people helping people set up their own systems. Um, so there's our our website if you wanted to build your own system. We have plans and and information on on how to build them yourself if you wanted to do a DIY style system. But I didn't want to. I didn't want to take up everybody's evening. So I'm happy. But I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone has on all the different things I just threw at you. No, great. I might have a quick question. <laughs> Um, so I know you said that you guys have a bunch of different projects ranging from like household production or more um, community garden projects mm -hmm. um, that you guys have put everywhere. Um, what are some of the like unique challenges attached to each project or the overlap that you have found that multiple projects have had with uh, challenges yes. or obstacles? So one of the things that we've found is hydroponics is ideal when you have access to water and power. Um, and so we found definitely some barriers, particularly when working with community organizations that wanna grow outside and may not have lots of, of uh, access to outdoor electricity and water, um, navigating those challenges, because that can very quickly, if you have to install an outdoor outlet or install more importantly, a water spigot, um, it can add some real costs. Uh, solar is is effective, but un, can be unreliable. Um, and so, when you have to use solar power to run your systems, it can it can increase the the risks. Um, in addition, uh, one of the things that we have stopped doing is working with organizations. If is approaching grant funding um, and presenting it to organizations as an opportunity, um, we found that if if there's no investment from community organizations on their side. Um, the program tends to fail. Um, the equipment gets left unused. Uh, and so now we require our partners as much as we can to have skin in the game. Um, so in Haiti, even with households that we work with, um, we don't charge them for the equipment, but we make sure that they build a uh, platform or a fence around their systems. Um, because that uh, is enough of an investment to create skin in the game. And then it, that drastically increased the success of our program. Uh, before we had that, most of the people just started using those buckets um, and that was not in a very effective method program. So even if you're working with individual households, we found that is they need to invest. It doesn't have to be a lot, but they need to invest something. Um, and that has has really increased our, our, our pro, uh, program success rate. Um, you know, we maybe just come to trainings. You have to come, you have to complete six courses um, of hydroponics and then you get access to the opportunities. Um, but if you don't do that, then um, try again next year. Uh, and so that's one of the things that we've really found is, is, is making sure that we have investment from the communities that we're working with. Um, and then they're, they're contributing in some way. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, those are some of the major things that we're dealing, that we've dealt with. Um, and that's the biggest problem you have com community style farming um, is that investment from the community. So one of the things that we've found is we worked the first year um, that we did the CSA, we attempted to provide people with hydroponic systems and have them grow and sell, basically sell us back the produce. And so they earn at the, once they produce. Um, and we found that that was not 
as effective as we would have thought it would be um, because the earnings are not so significant in the end. Um, we found that we needed to incentivize people up front and so do things like stipends and things like that. So they won't make as much on the produce on the end, but it, but it uh, allows us to keep them um, managing their systems and, and, and allows us to kind of pull out earlier if people aren't doing the things that they said they were going to do. And so it ends up keeping us um, more successful in our programs. So when you're talking about managing, managing um, a community garden, there needs to be, as I said, investment in some way, shape or form, um, but also and that goes both ways um, and making sure that people are actually engaged because the worst thing is you spend a lot of resources building a community garden and then the community garden looks like crap by July. Um, and so you want to make sure that you are um, finding investment, getting investment from the community in some way. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so I uh, heard you mention that uh, you're growing in abandoned lots, say, in the city of Hartford. And um, I'm trying to do that in Chicopee. Um, but how do I approach the city and... Uh, like, how do I tell the city that, hey, let me use this land or what, like, buy, let yeah. me buy the land? Yeah, so there's, that's a great question. So I'm not super familiar with Chicopee's, um, how it's set up. If they have a fair amount of vacant land, there may be a registry. Um, and you're going to want to talk to the, the planning and zoning um, side of your town. Uh, of Chicopee, um, there's probably a, a contact point for for planning and zoning or economic development um, and explain kind of what you're thinking and what you're looking for. Um, one of the benefits if you're doing hydroponics is that it's non-permanent, um, which is a pitch that we make to the city of Hartford because a lot of towns and cities will worry uh, that they, if they're going to even lease you it for zero dollars, their biggest concern is that they won't be able to sell that property and, and develop it um in the future and maybe they're never actually going to develop it but that option tends to make them hesitant um and so we found that by explaining that look if you need this if you need this property in five years to develop it we can pick our stuff up and move it to a different plot ultimately in the end but they may never actually develop it um and so it's the way you get your foot in the door um but definitely planning and zoning on on chicopee if you're trying to do something, um, we're happy to, to, to help in any way, um, even if it's just lending credibility on your side of things. Um, but- uh, Oh, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so um, we're trying to build a rooftop greenhouse right now. Um, and hopefully that's up by uh, end of June. And then the next step would be to scale up in like different lots. Yeah. Well, and you're welcome to come see what we're doing in Hartford. Chicopee is not too far away. So if you want to- Oh, no, not at all. At, um, at what we're doing in Hartford, we'd be happy to, to support and show you what we're doing in any way. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, uh, one question I had. Um, when developing your model for hydroponics, mm -hmm. um, did you ever explore like drip irrigation, other watering methods for growing food? Yeah, sure. Um, drip irrigation is a great methodology for growing something that is not well suited for a hydroponic system. Um, so drip, you know, we've looked into it because one of the things that, take Haiti, for example, one of the problems is not just nutrition, which is a problem that we face here in, in, in the United States in general, is an access to high quality food um, versus calories. And so things like potatoes, things like wheat, corn, all of those are not very effective in hydroponic systems. And so drip irrigation is kind of a hybrid between um, straight up hydroponics and, and, and field growing. Um, and so it's a great, I mean, it is, it's one of the best ways to have high levels of water efficiency in area, particularly in arid environments where water is not plentiful or expensive. Um, and so if you're gonna try to grow any root vegetables, I wouldn't recommend really trying in hydroponics. We have some cool trials around beets and carrots um, in our hydroponic systems, but uh, uh, the best way to do anything like that is to do drip irrigation uh, uh, or in traditional, more traditional style of, of growing. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, uh, I just was more interested uh, about that process and um, uh, being just like from a native community, 
farming is a big part of our uh, identity and culture. So, but they, but that method's more flood irrigation. A lot of it's transition to drip irrigation. Mm -hmm. Hydroponic is like a, and these other types of um, water uh, types of growing methods, it's kind of interesting to try out um, in regions that are arid uh, with better scarcity. So I didn't know if you had any like information about if hydroponic systems use less water than drip irrigation system methods. So they definitely do um, because you still suffer from evaporation with drip irrigation, not, not nearly as much as you would from just open field watering. Um, but what, because it's more enclosed, you lose less to um, evaporation in the heat. Uh, and so while your drip irrigation is, is very effective um, in water conser and conservation, hydroponics tends to be that much better. Um, it also allows you to grow more condensed than drip irrigation does, uh, okay. which can be a benefit for labor and, and, and maintenance. Okay, that makes sense. And then my other question was about the water supplements you add to these hydroponic systems. Do you know if those are costly over time or because um, I'm kind of new to that and trying to familiarize myself to these water supplements and nutrients you add to these hydroponic systems? Yeah, so fertilizer can definitely be an expense um, that can can rack up, um, particularly if you're not using, uh, if you're not being careful about how you're utilizing it and how you're dumping your systems and things like that. One of the things that we've really been pushing on is the standard practice in commercial hydroponics is to dump your reservoir every four weeks. Um, it allows you to have kind of perfect nutrient balance at all times. Uh, we found that that's not necessary, particularly if you're not trying to optimize every percent of yield. Um, if you, we've, we've shown that you can grow three, four or five months without ever changing your reservoir and dumping your reservoir, um, which allows for a lot less fertilizer consumption. Um, because when you dump every four weeks, you are still dumping a significant amount of fertilizer, um, a lot less than you'd use in traditional agriculture but you're still losing fertilizer. Um, and so it's, it's a balance on, on, on optimi optimization and, and, and uh, saving your, your kind of your input costs. Um, but uh, fertilizer is definitely a cost to consider. Um, however, you have to, in most, most farming practices, you have to fertilize in some ways. You could use compost and, and things like that in your fields, um, but, uh, you're not going to use that in hydroponics. You're going to use fertilizer. So um, it is a cost, but it, it 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 probably doesn't net you a major uh, cost in comparison to um, traditional agricultural practices in the long run. Okay, and then to add to that too, when you mentioned dumping the reservoir of the fertilizer. Is that safe for like if you're growing food outside outdoors or is it better for like a great water system? So it's 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 a matter of scale. One. So if you're growing at, at large scale, you have to be cautious about where you do it. So we work one of our sponsors is a Mexican hydroponic tomato farm. They grow like 20 on 20 acres of, of in greenhouses and they grow about nine million pounds of tomatoes. And they put their they dump their fertilizer into the sugarcane fields to fertilize the sugarcane fields that surround them. Um, when you're operating at a small scale, because you don't use a lot of fertilizer and hydroponics comparatively, your kind of your environmental uh, waste and pollution is relatively low. I mean, I would not recommend dumping directly into a waterway, um, but if you're in a field, um, the ni the nitrogen that you're putting off into the local ecosystem is going to be low. Um, in, in what actually ends up reaching a, a waterway. Um, so there is a, there's of course some amount of nitrogen that goes into the system, but it's the same that well, that would be the case as well as if you used um, a chicken poop and put it on your fields, right? That's nitrogen that will go into your, your local ecosystem. So it's all about moderation is, is moderating as much as you can and limiting as much as you can the waste product that goes out uh, at the end of the cycle. Um, but it's not, it's not, Unless you're at huge scale, it's not a huge risk. Uh, on large scale, it's not a huge risk for your local ecosystem, I guess is my answer. Okay, awesome, thank you.
All right. I don't know if there's any other questions, but thank you so much, Christian, for your presentation. That was really interesting to learn about everything that Lava is doing. Um, I don't know if Julian or Ben, do you guys have any final questions before we let, or I mean, comments before we let everybody go? No, I and mean, thank you for your presentation and thank you, Christian. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you both. That was awesome. And you're getting lots of love in the chats there, Christian. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining the workshop. We're, um, we were happy to have you. I hope it was interesting to everybody. And have a great night. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Flo. Oops, I, I was muted. Thanks. <laughs> Very inspiring. That was cool. Thanks Good. for getting Christian on board there. Yeah. Yeah, it was Appreciate interesting it. to hear what he had Thanks. to say. Thank you guys very Thank much. Thank you. Bye. Have a good night. You too. Thank you. Great work, Flo. You're a natural presenter. <laughs> you, didn't, Am I? <laughs> you didn't seem nervous or anything. <laughs> Felt a little. <laughs> really? Well, it Just a show. Tiny bit. Good work. <laughs> I got, oh yeah, maybe we can stop record or something.